Tradition is the cradle of progress. In the early years of motor racing, public enthusiasm favoured chivalrous, unbridled motorsport, featuring enormous cars. Then too, those with the sign of the four rings were among the best in the world. Audi's racing tradition is closely linked to the great drivers of the 1930s. Names like Rosemeyer, Müller, Peach, Nuvolari. And Stuck, a name which links Audi with modern times. Ja, ich hatte ja vor kurzem Gelegenheit auf der Avus das Originalauto meines Vaters zu fahren, den 16 Zylinder. Und ich muss sagen, erstmal in das Auto einzusteigen und zu wissen, da ist der Papa drin gesessen vor vielen Jahrzehnten, war ein recht ergreifendes Gefühl. Da kann ich ehrlich sagen, wenn wir sicher eine Träne nicht verdrücken müssen. Ich war eigentlich überrascht von einigen diesen Dingen an diesen Autos. Das Getriebe entsprach absolut der heutigen Zeit, eine perfekte Schaltung. Ganz anders natürlich die Sitzposition, die Sitzhaltung, die Ausrüstung, die Stoßdämpfer, auch natürlich die Straßenlage, das war ja abenteuerlich. Ich kann mir heute kaum vorstellen, wie es diese Athleten, muss man sagen, geschafft haben, früher am Nürburgring allein 500 Kilometer zu fahren. Und wie man gerade auf den Bildern auch gesehen hat, schön, hat man ja beim Autounion dann bei den Bergrennen, um die große Kraft auf den Boden zu bringen, jeweils auf jeder Seite hinten zwei Räder montiert. Das hat der Vater damals erfunden. Damals hat er nichts gewusst vom Quattro-Antrieb. Heute haben wir natürlich etwas viel Besseres. Wir haben den Quattro-Antrieb, der natürlich aufgrund dieses Problems resultiert. Wie bringe ich die Kraft auf den Boden? Wie verteile ich sie? Und man hat dann bei Audi weitergemacht, um diesen Quattro-Antrieb entsprechend zu forcieren, zu entwickeln, hat man das härteste und schnellste Prüfer der Welt, nämlich die Rallye, hergenommen. Da haben wir das entwickelt, oder hat Audi das entwickelt, was heute der Quattro-Antrieb darstellt, nämlich ein perfektes, sicheres Antriebssystem. First and most important show places were the wonderful, winding, tricky, cruel, endless rally courses. The arrival of the Quattro with its fresh vision, remarkable technology and a rate of forward progress that everybody understood revived the whole sport and triggered off a worldwide rally boom. Quattro made its rally debut at the 1981 January Rally in Austria. It was driven by Wittmann and Nestinger, whose privilege it was was to celebrate the Quattro's first victory. The Quattro was immediately entered for the World Championship, the first round of which was the Monte Carlo Rally, a daunting challenge to any newcomer. Our first star is Hanno Mikula from Finland. On the 26th of January 1981, he became a topic of general amazement. We did the first stage quite near, uh, near Grenoble, short one, 14 k's, but uh, all the way uphill nearly. And uh, I remember Darnis uh, star started in front of me, uh, one minute in front of me. And uh, when I had done seven k's, I passed him like anything, you know, it was a sort of a uh, very uh, tight bend and then maybe half a kilometer straight and uh, you know, I passed him maybe 100 kilometers different in the speed. When we came to the start of the next stage, uh, Ari pulled uh, next to me and he said that with David Richards, who used to be his co-driver, they had a pet, uh, what was my time? Nobody really knew how well the car will go and uh, Dave Richards said that I did the same than the best time and Ari said you were 10 seconds faster than best time and I remember very well, I said, yes, uh, you are quite right, but I was one minute, ten seconds faster than the next one. So that was a real shock for everybody. The newcomer upset the entire competition. We've been asleep for too long, said one team manager, and now comes the rude awakening. It was time to get down to work.
Despite the fine-sounding names of the other manufacturers and drivers, they had no chance against the new technology. The Quattro had turned the rally hierarchy upside down. When the service teams brought them to the rally circuits, the first production Quattros were quickly surrounded by admiring crowds. Autumn in Tuscany and a stopover in Siena during the most attractive event of the era, the San Remo Rally. The event is in its third day and something unheard of is happening. A woman, Michelle Mouton, is ahead of the field in a world championship rally and hasn't the slightest intention of giving up her lead. The event reaches its climax in a tense finale between the ladies and the great Ari Vatana. But Michel Mouton, co-driver of Fabrizia Pons, and the Audi Quattro remain safely ahead and enter the history books as the first women's team to win a world championship rally. For Quattro Technology, this was a delightfully new interpretation of a great idea. Michelle may well have been the fastest woman ever to get behind the steering wheel of a car, but to defeat all the male competitors in a technical sport, now that was something out of the ordinary. It's true that at that point, the fact to be a woman was um, a point particular where, where the fans wanted to come and see me more closer and everything, and touch me, I remember forever, of course, Portugal and Greece, for example, and even Ivory Coast. The media had their problems with this young lady. What were they to call her? The gentle savage, the black tigress, the pretty volcano, or even the devil with the face of an angel? Whatever name they chose, it was great to see how the men got all worked up. After all, driving had been one of the last remaining male bastions. Michel Mouton and Fabrizia Pons on the way to the South Pole, melting the ice of the men's world just where it is thickest. Rallying's new diversity, its changed surroundings and the popularity of its stars triggered off a worldwide boom in this sport at the beginning of the 1980s. It captivated the media and above all the spectators themselves, the people who were determined to witness it at first hand. All this fell on ground which couldn't have been more fertile and the fans' enthusiasm caused them to go to amazing lengths to get close to their idols. We cannot forget Portugal, particularly. It was really, 
even the limit to, to be able to do what we had to do, you know, and uh, people on the road and people wanted to touch me when I was at the start of the stage. I remember forever one guy who opened the, the, the door to touch me when the guy was counting three, two, one just to go. I mean, it's, it's, it was difficult. But in another way, of course, I was trying to understand also that it was a normal way for them. And we have a, a chance to have a sport where the people can be so close to the driver. It's not like all the other sport where people are parked around. In the rallying, people are really part of, of the game. And so uh, if I have only one image, I think it's a positive picture, and a nice picture. The heart of the rally enthusiast is a kind of quattro too, turbocharged and driving for all it's worth. But despite all the overexcitement and the high level of popularity enjoyed by the sport and all its stars, there were no situations in which mass hysteria took over. People simply want to touch, or at least try to touch, the people they admire. from Mediterranean countries in particular feel a strong emotional attachment to rally stars and to try to get directly involved. Not as a half-hearted audience, but if possible as co-organizers. Hence their lively facial expressions and elegant movements. this golden age of rallying, the friendly atmosphere even fascinated people who would normally wish to have nothing to do with the cars, the noise or the sport itself. It's a sport that enthralls people all the way, from New Zealand to Europe. It moves them, and when, for example, a gem of Italian craftsmanship comes to a grinding halt just before the finishing line, the agony no, is also felt at Ferrari, the roadside. Ferrari. Porca In 1982, the regular Audi team, consisting of Hanno Mikula, Arne Hertz, Michel Mouton, and Fabrizio Pons, was reinforced by Stig Blomqvist and Bjorn Sederberg. For some events, they were joined by the Italian Michel Cinotto and the Austrian Franz Wittmann, of which various outsiders came to some surprising conclusions. I see in the first line, what I was told at the beginning of the year, that my opponent eine neue Technologie ist, ein neues Auto, ein vierergetriebenes Auto, das den Weg in die Zukunft weist. Und gegen dieses Auto werde ich wahrscheinlich verlieren. Musik 
1982 was the year of breakthrough, perhaps the most successful demonstration of technical progress by way of sporting achievement in automotive history. Audi easily won the manufacturer's title in the World Championship, although the competition certainly didn't give them any quarter. Towards the end of the year, when the points were added together to decide who the world champion driver was, the contest was still open. Two drivers were in the running, Walter Rühl in an Opel and Michel Mouton in an Audi. The Ivory Coast Rally, the last event of the year, was the decider. The Ivory Coast Rally is a small reminder of how rallying was born and what it stood for. Tests of reliability, driving from A to B across sparsely inhabited areas, when what counts most is simply getting through. It was only later that sheer speed acquired increasing importance. African terrain still reminds us of the humble beginnings of rally driving. story of this rally was therefore Michel Mouton versus Walter Rühl, who at that time was in a competitor's team. We have to face the facts and admit that Michel failed to get the championship title as a result of the fickleness of material, a minor technical malfunction. As luck would have it, precisely the same thing happened to Hanno Mikula and the Audi team manager, who had set off into the bush to help Michel, only to get stuck in the middle of nowhere with a broken gearbox. This was the traditional spirit of technical marathons, the glory of not giving up, of improvisation, do it yourself and pressing on, even when the stopwatch might just as well have been replaced by an hourglass. A feeling of frustration prevails. Nothing can put you back up among the leaders. So getting the car back on the road is the only victory left to relish. By now it was time to get the man who had put up such stiff opposition to transfer to the Audi team. So in the winter of 1984, Walter Ruhl arrived as a four-wheel drive trainee, accompanied by Christian Geistdorfer, his co-driver. Together with Blomqvist, Nicola and Mouton, this was the most powerful team Audi had ever fielded. Rohl's quattro debut in the first World Championship event was convincing, and he obviously took a delight in showing what he could do. In other words, driving calmly to victory in the Monte Carlo Rally. Scandinavia's snow king, Stig Blomqvist, also driving for Audi, was pushed into second place. And Walter Rohl celebrated one of the most impressive triumphs in his career, his first Audi entry, an immediate triumph in Monte Carlo. One of the many symbols of the great breakthrough. Ich glaube einfach generell, dass die 70er, 80er Jahren 
waren einfach das Jahrzehnt des Automobils. Das war einfach, das Automobil hat plötzlich, war das, das Ziel eines jeden, dieses Gefühl der Freiheit, dass ich ein Auto habe, dass ich überall in kürzester Zeit hinfahren kann, dass ich mir die Welt anschauen kann. Und da hat dann auch der Sport dazugehört. The talk that makes the world go round comes from the tension of opposites. This interplay features strongly in the eight seasons of a World Rally Championship, the most diversified contest in any type of sport. Day and night, hot and cold weather, hard roads and soft surfaces, loneliness and huge crowds, team events and individual victory, sprints and marathons, the human body and technological advancement. Once round the world in 11 championship events, Monte Carlo and its incomparably long cold night in the French Maritime Alps, the pale northern light of the Swedish rally in February, or Portugal, known for the cruelty of its rocky roads high up in the Sierra. An Easter marathon called the Safari, which inflicts severe wear and tear on both men and machine in Africa. countless bends at the edge of the cliffs, a sign that we must be in Corsica. The friendliness of the Greeks during that wonderful classic event called the Acropolis Rally, returning at the end by ship as though one had jumped over the islands. The curving, sandy roads of New Zealand. The never-ending surprises in Argentina. <laughs> Finland, with its fast straights, humps, curves and hollows, leapfrogging a thousand lakes. The unique mood of the San Remo Rally with its excursion into Tuscany. And the British Rally, which takes us to the remotest corners of the island and the place with the longest Welsh name.
Incredible years in the history of a make and the accomplishment of an idea. Highlights included Hanno Mikula's Drivers' World Championship title in 1983, and Audi's second Manufacturers' World Championship title in 1984, which was accompanied by Stieg Blomqvist winning the Drivers' Award. Times grew tougher as competitors set to and converted their cars to four-wheel drive. Thoroughbred racing vehicles were being built everywhere, not based in the least on series production. Everywhere, that is, except at Audi, where the Sport Quattro was developed into a machine that was stronger, more compact and more uncompromising than even the original Quattro. It came to be known affectionately as Shorty. For Ferdinand Pisch, who was then Audi's director in charge of development, this car was a way to respond to the competition without giving up any of the Audi's production car principles. But it was still an extreme, unrestrained machine, loud and wild, a car which left nobody cold who had anything to do with it. If I have some emotion, of course it's the noise of the Quattro. I mean, to, to, nobody can forget the noise. Even today, I think we miss this kind of noise. Technical modifications made it more and more difficult for the drivers to cope with their working environment. Cockpit temperatures up to 70 degrees, marathon stress and the pressure of special sprint stages brought them to the brink of physical collapse. Their only solace was to be found in the welcoming reception centres and the personal care that awaited them there. The leisure programme was compiled by medical advisers whose significance had increased enormously over the past few years. Stretching and pulling, suggestion and meditation, massage and relaxation. After having restored their plumage, the eagles rise again for the next tough test. Technical development was encouraged by a large amount of leeway in the Group B regulations, and the next aspect to be developed was service. The days of patient improvisation in the bosom of nature have long since gone. However, along the route, local supplies are always at hand, with helicopters to set up a reliable transport network. You only need to whistle twice, and the chopper is there. As this escalation in complexity and nervous energy continued, Audi put its imagination into overdrive and made the next quantum leap in its development work. This was the successor to the Sports Quattro, the S1. The S1's rivals were all sports racing cars, adhering to the extreme power philosophy and employing the first generation of electronic sorcerer's apprentices. Compact, venomous and excessive. 
he did all the testing for suspension and wings and all that and and uh, on one test road there same time they were doing a formula one race and it was exactly same length than this formula one race where we were testing on the gravel road and we were just four seconds slower than their lap time so we said it's really going fast uh, <laughs> This is where we enter a nirvana with some of the most exotic driving of all time. bist du bei dem Auto mit dem Denken schon zu langsam. It was too much. The whole business revved up out of control and exploded. 1985 and 1986 will be remembered as the craziest years of rally driving. The sport's popularity led to spectator problems, which threatened to get out of control. In 1986, Audi therefore withdrew the S1 from active rally participation, as it was simply impossible to continue in these circumstances and in the absence of adequate safety measures. In 1987, a new philosophy fortunately prevailed, and new Group A rules were compiled. The thought of tackling the Safari Rally with the highly civilized Quattro 200 was most exhilarating. Audi's drivers were Hanno Mikula and Walter Ruhl.
The 30-year myth that the safari could only be won by a workhorse of the simplest possible design was exposed. Suddenly, the businessman saloons, with all their high-tech intelligence, began to take the checkered flag. It was this relaxed situation, seeing how the 200 would do in Africa without the pressure of competition, that led quite unexpectedly to a milestone in Audi sports history. Two Audis took part, with first place going to Mikola and second place to Ruhl. This was Audi's first victory in the safari and the first win by a four-wheel drive car. However, the feeling developed within Audi that there was nothing else to prove. Everything had been said and done, and the company's wildest dreams had all come true. In 1987, Audi therefore announced its retirement from rallying. But let us say farewell to an era by returning one more time to the magic mountain of rallying. The Col du Turini is a rather insignificant pass 1,600 metres above sea level. Only the rally fans have turned it into a legend. With Monte Carlo in its usual nocturnal splendor, the surviving teams gather on Casino Square for the start of the last night and the final stage. Just 40 kilometers as the crow flies, but several mountains and valleys away, people have been waiting here on the Turini for hours and have started a few additional festivities on their own. When the first car starts down below, there's still plenty of time up here for last-minute preparations. But as the distance between the cars at the bottom and the people up here closes, the suspense builds up to the climax when the rally hits the mountain. Ja, der Turini ist natürlich etwas, das ist ein Begriff, äh, der mehr oder weniger schon von den Zuschauern geprägt wurde. Das ist äh, etwas, wo du am Start stehst und denkst tatsächlich schon, in 11 Kilometer kommt oben diese, dieses, diese Freilichtbühne. Und du überlegst am Start, was soll ich machen? Soll ich da die große Show abziehen oder soll ich vernünftig drüber fahren? Von der Prüfung selbst als, als Fahrer kannst du äh, tolle Schlüsse ziehen, du, es gibt ja Zwischenzeiten, wenn du oben bist und du weißt dann, wie schnell du aufgefahren bist und wie schnell dass du die 11 Kilometer runtergefahren bist. Und da habe ich mir immer halt so meine persönlichen äh, Taten herausgesucht und war dann wieder glücklich, dass ich da festgestellt habe, ja, na, jetzt war ich nicht ganz so schnell, aber runter jetzt, da war ich richtig gut. <lacht> is to the Europeans what Pikes Peak in Colorado is to the Americans. Ich bin damals nach Amerika gegangen, so, um, um, meine, um meine Arbeit zu machen. Hinten habe ich gesagt, Gott sei Dank, das war ein ganz wichtiger Punkt in meinem Leben, das muss man erlebt haben, dass man da 
mit 220 er Schotterstraße Nauffahrt von der Straßenkante geht es wie von der Tischkante ohne alles 400, 500 Meter ins Nichts mit einem Auto, das jenseits von 600 PS hat. Zu jedem Zeitpunkt kannst du mit Gasfuß irgendwas verkehrt machen. Ein Auto, das damals das erste Rallye-Auto war, wo man ein bisschen Abtrieb versucht hat zu machen mit den Flügeln. Es war also unheimlich toll und ich muss sagen, ich habe es im Fahren genossen und habe aber auch noch mehr genossen, die Aufnahmen nachher von, vom Hubschrauber zu sehen, wie toll das Auto da, wie auf Schienen den Bergen aufgefahren ist. Also das war sicherlich schon der Gipfel, was man mit so einem Auto äh, hat machen können. The state of Colorado is the land of the Grand Canyon and of Pikes Peak, 4,301 meters high. This is more American than any other mountain in the USA because of how it was discovered and conquered and also because of its sheer American size, breadth and height. There's been an annual car race here since 1916 and it's now part of American legend. Pikes Peak, the race to the clouds. This was absolutely the final appearance of an S1 out of captivity with almost 600 horsepower under the hood and a top speed of up to 190 kilometers per hour on steeply climbing gravel road. It was destined to become one of Ruhl's most awe-inspiring, flawless drawings, the ascent of the pike by a Bavarian team. was followed by a test session punctuated with world record attempts on the Nardo track in southern Italy to prepare the Audi Quattro 200 team for circuit racing. In its world record version in Nardo, with an output of almost 600 bhp, the Quattro was good for a top speed of over 400 km per hour and an average of 332 km per hour. It was ready for a competition season. The Trans Am is one of the most popular American championships and the longest surviving of all the modern day US racing series. The 1988 Audi team consisted of Hans Stück, Bad Rühl, and the American Hurley Haywood. But at night it's a different world. Go out and find a girl. Come on, come on, and dance all night. Just like the heat, it'll be all right. And babe, don't you know it's a pity the days can't be like the nights in the summer, in the city, in the summer, in the city.
What appealed to the spectators and the media most of all was that a normal four-door sedan, a type of 200 Quattro, had been merely adapted for racing, whereas the American and Japanese entries were based on genuine sports cars. The sedan was just as effective on racetracks from California to Florida and from Texas to Michigan, and after 13 events, it had won both titles, the manufacturers and, for Hurley Haywood, the individual drivers' championships. Yeah, it was actually a logical consequence of Audi, after man in the rally, on the losen undergrund, snow, staub and dreck, bewiesen hat, that Quattro unersetzlich is, is auch den Leuten zu beweisen, die mit ihrem Auto nur auf der Straße rumfahren. Was lag da näher, als auf die Rundstrecke zu gehen, sprich nach Amerika, denn da war erstmal ein gutes Einsatzgebiet für uns und wie wir anfangs kamen, wurden wir ja belächelt, was wir mit Quattro auf der Rennstrecke wollten. Aber nach spätestens zwei Rennen wussten die Amis Bescheid, dass ein Quattro-System in Verbindung natürlich mit dem ganz Gesamtauto nahezu unschlagbar war und wir haben diese Siegeserie ja fortgesetzt bis zum Gewinn der Deutschen Turnwagenmeisterschaften und haben da auch der Konkurrenz bewiesen, dass einfach ein allradgetriebenes Auto, sprich natürlich das Quattro-System, wirklich durch nichts zu ersetzen ist. Success is a challenge to tackle the next higher hurdle. And so in 1989, Audi entered the next American League, the IMSA series. Its regulations are more flexible, meaning that Audi had to build a genuine racing version of the Quattro. This gave rise to the Audi 90 Quattro, with all the hallmarks of a sports car which differed from the usual road version, in one way at least, its 720 horsepower engine. The regular drivers, Haywood, Stuck and Ruhl, were joined by Scott Goodyear. Together they pressed ahead with track testing so that this completely new design was ready to race within only four months. Race tracks are Walter Ruhl's second home, with second being the operative word, since for him there's nothing better than a good rally something that ought to be brought home to the Americans. I see me here a bit as a sportschafter of rally sports. I must also the rallyfahrer here vertreten, so that the rallyfahrer endlich wissen, that we rallyfahrer auf der Rundstrecke genauso gut sind wie sie. The 15 races in the IMSA series are held all over the United States and Canada in constantly changing conditions. One day, it's a street circuit, the next, a classic racetrack, while the length of the races ranges from a one-hour sprint to a 24-hour marathon. People in America have a strong will to succeed. Nobody gives up for trivial reasons here. Pit stops are a necessity in a long-distance race, and so they're used to provide a showbiz element involving a very complex ritual. The result? is a happening for six performers, a dance scene for four artists, each in charge of a wheel, one refueling specialist and one conductor. drove to victory in West Virginia, Ohio, Kansas, California, New York, Connecticut, and Laguna Seca, seven times in one season. 
a record which did wonders for Audi's popularity all over the continent. Those drivers got for fifteen hundred dollars. Hans Stuck from our West Germany, the winner. Thanks to my people working on the car and greetings from Korea. Hola, 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 hola. The return to Germany came in 1990, ten years after the Quattro Revolution. And as with all proper revolutions, it changed the world, or at least the car world. The Audi team for the German Touring Car Championship consisted of Hövat Kreiner, Hans Novak and Dieter Barscher. The massive Audi V8 saloon was developed in record time into a competition car and got a warm welcome from the spectators. At the beginning, Hans Stuck was the only Audi driver, but later he was joined by Frank Bieler, Hubert Haupt, Frank Jelensky, and the ever-popular Walter Rühl, who concentrated mainly on development work. In this immensely popular series, with its record numbers of spectators, Audi faced tough competition from major manufacturers, and presenting the advantages of a high-performance saloon with four-wheel drive to them proved to be most enjoyable. The list of entries was varied and international, without the old hierarchies, and this variety ensured many a scene full of harmony and effortless performance. The season increased in tension and excitement, and the fans' fervour grew ever more tangible, not only in a metaphorical sense. The contenders came together, their duels became more dramatic, and there were many of the sudden contacts, which we call Sunday meetings. was a newcomer in the German Touring Car Championship and by no means a favourite. However, Hans Stück worked himself through the field to an increasing extent and at the end of the season in Hockenheim there was the most spectacular result which could be imagined. Stück won both heats with the first three positions going to Audi and carried off the title of German champion. In 1991, the slogan was, same procedure as last year. With even more entries, the advantages of a potent four-wheel drive saloon were demonstrated to maximum effect. The season again culminated in a crucial final in Hockenheim, the only difference this time being that the new German champion from the Audi team was Frank Bieler. Frank Bieler also led the Audi team in its next challenge. This time, the Quattro idea met up with the European concept of an all-embracing two-litre championship, the best arena for this being the French Super Tourism Champonnet, with its famous names and famous faces. A 
And so off the team went to the classic French circuits, from Montelieri to Nogaro, from Magnicours to Paul Ricard. Frank Bieler and his French colleague Marc Sud were up against teams from Alfa Romeo, BMW, Nissan, Opel and Peugeot. During this rapid tour of France, the Quattros were again unbeatable. Frank Bieler won the French Touring Car Championship on his first attempt, while for Audi, it was the third title in a row. Times are changing, and so are profiles and degrees of popularity in international championships. The future which awaits us is open and contains many unknowns with one fixed quantity, Quattro One. Ich würde sagen, der Motorsport der Zukunft steht unter drei großen Überschriften. Einmal Sicherheit, zweitens Umweltbewusstsein und drittens kostengünstig. Ich glaube, wenn wir diese drei wichtigsten Parameter unter einen Hut bringen können mit einer gewissen Reglementsstabilität, dann werden wir die Basis legen, auch noch in zehn Jahren Motorsport zu treiben. Ganz wichtig ist auch, dass wir einmal von dieser Alibi-Funktion wegkommen, dass wir sagen, wir müssen Motorsport betreiben, um für die Entwicklung der Serie etwas zu tun. Das tun wir auch. Aber der Motorsport ist eine Berechtigung auch deshalb, weil er Entertainment ist, Unterhaltung ist. Millionen von Zuschauern schauen sich Rennen an, im Fernsehen, live, weil sie unterhalten werden wollen. Und deswegen hat der Motorsport einfach seine Berechtigung. Und da müssen wir hinkommen. In 1994, following its conquest of France, Audi returned to German racing circuits to take part in the newly established ADAC D1 Touring Car Cup. Thanks to the two-litre formula, which applies all over the world, these attractive touring car events have now gained another exciting championship. The schedule was fast and furious. The Ava circuit in Berlin. The Nürburgring, Ring. Solda. And Spa in Belgium down to the Salzburg Ring in Austria, Sandfort, Wunstorf, and back to the Austria Ring. Together with its successful partners, the SMS team from Cadalsburg, the French Rock team, and the Italian Emilio Redelli team, Audi entered its factory cars for events in Germany and Italy. The near series Audi 80 competition has continued Audi's successful motorsport tradition in the 1990s. Some of the technical delicacies of our competition cars, sequential gear shift, permanent four-wheel drive, and a four-cylinder engine with two valves per cylinder developing about 300 horsepower. At the wheel, Frank Bieler, German and French touring car champion, Hans-Joachim Struck and Patrick Bernhardt. Newcomers were the rapid Italian driver Emmanuel Piro, a former Formula One driver, and Dindo Capello. There was a new name at the head of Audi Sport too. Strategy was now in the capable hands of Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich. Audi's opponents have a high reputation and come from reputable houses. Their drivers, like Audi's own, have only one motto. Down on the accelerator as soon as possible, down on the big pedal a whole lot later. of a second can be decisive in international touring car racing. To drop only a tenth of a second may mean losing a much wanted victory. Audi, BMW, Ford and Nissan were able to call upon many a leading driver for their touring car cup entries so that the public were offered many an exciting race. The season started well for Audi with wins in Zolda, on the Avis circuit and in Sandfort. In Wunstorf, the fans were beside themselves with excitement as Audi took the first four places. After two thirds of the season were over, Frank Bieler had a comfortable lead, but suddenly Audi's competitors discovered new strengths. 
Venezuelan driver Johnny Chicotto fought back brilliantly and was soon Beeler's closest rival. Tension rose to fever pitch as these two Audi and BMW drivers duelled for the lead. Their cars neck and neck in scenes that have seldom been surpassed for excitement. but fair fight for the championship decided only by the smallest margin in Chicago's favor at the last event on the Norberg ring. German symphony for four cylinders produced a resounding echo in Italy. At the end of a full season on racing circuits steeped in tradition, the finale was held in Tuscany, the classic heart of Italy. A wonderful setting, and the Audi team was in equally good spirits. Emmanuel Piero had already gained enough points to secure the driver's championship, so that the Mugello race was, so to speak, only the icing on the cake. Apart from the manufacturer's championship, with top teams from Peugeot and Alfa Romeo still hoping to call their own. So much rain was hardly necessary to demonstrate the finest sides of the Quattro's character. But give good drivers their head, and there's no stopping them. Capello, Piero, and Bilar, first, second, and third. Not forgetting the manufacturer's trophy to add to the driver's title, already safely in Audi's possession. What can we say except mille grazie for a super show? Ciao, until we meet again. And don't forget, Good things come in a quattro package.